you focus on the breath and try to stay focused on the breath. It's partly a matter of technique and partly a matter of your values. The technique can be explained in just a few pages, in John Lee's Seven Steps, just two or three pages. And they cover a lot of the territory in the technique. Focusing on the breath, finding a spot in the body where you can stay centered, and then working from there to let the breath energy feel good throughout the body so it's all connected together. Noticing what kind of breathing then can maintain a sense of connectedness and comfort in the body. That's pretty much the technique. But there's also the question of values, why you're meditating. And sometimes you can see that influencing the technique. If you have the idea that you're here to gain a vision, well, you find yourself pushing the technique in the direction of a vision. If you want to clamp down and have no awareness of your body at all, you can do that. You can push the technique in that direction as well. So it's important to understand that as we're developing concentration, the important element is balance, a sense of ease, comfort, well-being inside. It's not as flashing and not as extreme as we sometimes want to go in the meditation, but it's got a lot more value. Value for what? Value in that it allows you to observe the mind and understand what drives the mind, and particularly what drives the mind to create suffering. We all want pleasure. We all want happiness. And we, yet we find ourselves doing things that lead to unhappiness. And even though we may know better, we tend to hang out with our old bad habits. This is where our values come in. When you understand why it's important to focus on training the mind, why it's impo important to have this sense of centered well-being. This comes under the element of right effort, called generating desire. You have to make yourself want to do this in order to do it well. And there are times when it's easy to want it. You find that things click, everything falls into place. It feels really good being with a breath, feels really good being centered right here. And you can't imagine why you would ever leave. But then you find yourself leaving, which means you have to dig deeper, even when things are going well. And as for when things are not going well, that's when your sense of values has to kick in, why you stick with this, even when you leave the mo monastery and go back home. Why would you want to stay with the breath as you're dealing with other people, dealing with your work? Or even if you're staying here, sometimes you find it hard to stick with the practice. This is where it's good to remind yourself exactly what is this all about, that chant we had just now, and the nature of the world. Basically it's undependable, inconstant, stressful, not self. And what people do is so much driven by their craving. And part of the mind says, so what? That's the part of the mind that you've got to look into. What does it want to do? Why does it want to stay a slave to craving? We all know about aging, illness, and death. And that chant. The passage we chanted just now draws the parallels between aging and inconstancy.
stress and illness, not self and death. These things go together, and they can't be denied. That's the way the world is. But there's part of the mind that says, well, I want to do this in spite of all that. I want to do that in spite of all that. This training of the mind is getting in the way. And one of the questions you can ask is, well, how much more do you want to suffer? Do you really love yourself? If you really love yourself, you try to figure out how to find a happiness that you can depend on. And the mind will say, well, I'll wait for that later. And there's some other things I want to do in the meantime. And this is where the quality of heedfulness comes in. Realizing there may not be a later. You may not have that chance to come back to the practice. And it's your willingness to see what your true best interests are. That's a lot of the wisdom of the practice. A while back I was reading a history of the nineteenth century, and they talked about one of the favorite types of literature back in those days was reading lives of great people. And the typical story was that someone started out with a lot of handicaps. and yet was able to make his way up. Most of the stories were about him, men. But the novels of the time were also filled with women who were willing to make sacrifices for the sake of a greater happiness. And then sometime in the twentieth century the taste changed. We liked our anti-heroes, the people who saw through the sham of trying to make yourself something better than what you currently are. And we're more concerned about the honesty of just their true feelings right now, rather than trying to make themselves into something. They just wanted to stay where they were and explore where they were. And the honesty of that approach was presented as an ideal. And they did see through a lot of the sham in the Victorian era, but they really misunderstood what it means to be true to yourself. It doesn't mean that you just stay the way you are, accept the way you are. It means you really look at yourself and see what are your potentials. Where is the potential for suffering in your life? Where is the potential for happiness in your life? And maybe that is a noble quest to find a true happiness, develop all the good qualities of mind that you at the moment have only in a rudimentary form, a potential form, and I try to actually actualize them. In other words, it's not a matter of pretending to be something that you aren't, but realizing that you do have a potential to make something more of yourself. And one way of helping in that process is to get yourself out of your individual narratives and go, Look at the larger shape of things. This may be one of the reasons why on the night of his awakening the Buddha started out with that knowledge of his past lives. But then from there he didn't go straight into the present moment. He had that second knowledge as well, seeing that all beings throughout the universe died and then were reborn, in line with the karma. It was seeing the larger picture that he also saw the larger pattern. The way our lives go is dependent on our actions. Where do our actions come? They come from our views and from our intentions, the two acting together. And so he realized that that was the area where his mind really needed to be trained in terms of how he looked at things and how he aimed his actions, his motivations, his purposes in, act in acting, speaking, thinking. Once he saw the larger picture, it was a lot easier to get into the present moment and to stay there and focus on the right things in the present moment. Where is the potential for greater understanding in the present moment? He so was looking at the question of suffering. What in the mind right now is creating suffering? 
Where is the suffering right now? What's creating it? What can you do to put an end to it? There's that willingness to look at the world at large that got him focused properly and kept him going on the path. The same with that passage we chanted just now from the Ratabala Sutta. So Ratabala's reasons for ordaining. Notice he didn't say, I am subject to aging, illness, and death. He said, this is the way the world is. The world as a whole, you go out and you look at it, it's swept away, it does not endure, it offers no shelter, there's no one in charge, it has nothing of its own. It's a slave to craving. That's the way things are everywhere. Again and again, the Buddha points this out as an important part of basically growing up and developing a more mature attitude, a more mature set of values, looking at the world as a whole. Where is it going? We have that chant frequently, I am subject to aging, illness and death, separation. I'm the heir to my actions. That's part of a sutta where the Buddha goes on to say you should also reflect it's not just you, it's everybody, no, no matter where you go, no matter what kind of life you live. People are subject to aging, illness, and death. Everybody is subject to separation. Everybody is the heir to their actions. And it's that principle of action that's the escape. So what this means is as we're meditating, we're not pretending to be somebody that we aren't. It's be, we meditate because we love ourselves. We have compassion for ourselves. And we realize that making some sacrifices now will lead to good results down the line, the results we want. And part of this has taken on faith. We hear about the death as we hear about nirvana. And sometimes it sounds like a story, a fairy tale, or as one person said, an archetype. And we have to take it on trust that this is in actuality. We heard John Mahabhu was saying that if he could bring nirvana out and show to everybody, everybody would want it. No questions asked. We take that on faith. But then we look around us. What is life like without that possibility? It's a pretty depressing prospect. When Ratabala decided to ordain, it wasn't because he just stopped with the world as a slave to craving, as if that were the end of everything. That's the way things were, but he was also looking for another possibility, a way out. And so it's because we value the possibility of freedom, the possibility of a true happiness. That's where we make the sacrifices that we do. It may be something simply as, as simple as dealing with a difficult person and realizing that you should stay with your breath first rather than getting absorbed in the drama. Or dealing with the desire to indulge ourselves. There's this modern tendency to believe that by Indulging ourselves, we show our love for ourselves. Well, in some sense, the Victorians had it right. If you really love yourself, you want to make something more out of yourself than you are at the moment, which may mean making sacrifices. But it's learning how to make the sacrifice in such a way that it's intelligent, that you're not denying a part of yourself. You're fully aware that you've got these other desires, these other, other tendencies, these other cravings. But you also realize that no matter how real they are, they're not your true friends. And either you have to do battle with them or you have to convert them. So 
And this is what heedfulness teaches us. That's one of the main motivations the Buddha gives for generating desire to stay on the path. The other interesting enough is a sense of pride. I've come this far. I've learned this much about the Dharma. It would be a shame if I dropped it. So pride has its juices on the path as well. I mean, it's not the false pride of pretending to be somebody that you're not. It's the pride of someone who doesn't want to be a traitor to himself or herself. Or someone who wants to be able to look in the mirror every morning and say, I'm doing my best. And there's that question that is <clears throat> asked in one of the passages, days and nights fly past, fly past, what am I doing right now? What am I becoming right now? And hopefully you're not just becoming an older person. Hopefully you're doing something with this in and out breath that you've got. To gain some deeper understanding is why is there suffering? What can be done to stop it? And realizing that finding an answer to that question is one of the most important things you can do.